Mark, fantastic to get you on Real Vision. Finally, it's my chance to get to sit down and chat to you. So I, I finally, you mess with the rest, end up with the best. You know that, Rob. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Listen, I want to pick your brains about a bunch of things because there's a lot going on in the world and you've always got some really interesting perspectives. One of the things we're kind of framing right now and something that's going through my head and probably going through your head is, are we in some sort of bubble? You know, if we talk about the financial markets first, what's your perspective on this? Because it seems like there's a lot going on. Yeah, um, there's two types of bubbles in my mind. There are um, interest rate fed bubbles and then there are people driven buying bubbles, right? And depending on the asset, I think it's a little bit different. But I think for the most part, this is a Fed driven bubble more than it is anything else. You know, so you you can't really compare this part of just stock prices to what we saw in with the Internet bubble. Right. Because interest rates back then were four or five percent. So people have had risk free alternatives. They could just put the money in in a savings account and and make money. So it was a, a personal choice to come in and buy. Um, but, you know, on some of the collectible items, I think that it's a, there's joint responsibility. There's the money available from the Fed, and then there's people looking to get into a variety of different types of collectibles, whether it's crypto, whether it's trading cards, what, you know, art, whatever it may be. And what about the massive rise of retail? You know, the, you know I've seen you on Twitter talk about it. We've all been looking at this. The huge rise of retail, which is great. But it seems like it's come very quickly with stimulus checks. And, right. you know, it, it, it's, it seems to be driven by other things as well. What's your take on that whole situation? I love it, right? Because it, it's the revenge of the, of the nerd. You know, it's the revenge of the, the little guy. And it's no different. It's just using some of the same techniques that brokerage firms have used forever. You know, get long and get loud, except now in this day and age, um, you can go on a, a message board, but unlike the, the the internet days when there would be a few thousand people on Yahoo message boards or maybe a hundred thousand people on message boards across a variety of stocks, now you've got you know Wall Street bets and, and the like, where you've got this concentrated effort and you've got the zeitgeist, this mindset of you know screw the big guy, right? Screw Wall Street, and you combine those two together, and it's not investing. And it's it's almost not even trading. It's more like revenge. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, when I say that, um, I say it's not necessarily a bad thing because of what it represents and what that can th- that impact can be going forward. To me, that's what makes it good because you can see this group investing of little guys really turning into something that that has a powerful impact. But like I wrote on, on my Reddit, there's going to be some bloodshed along the way, right? There are going to be people who lose money. There's going to be pain. It's never a straight line. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be people who fall out, people who make money. And there's going to be a lot of traditionalists that think it's just the worst thing ever for the little guy because they think they know more than the little guy. Yeah, I mean, I think that whole theme many of us have been looking at for years, the democratization of, of finance and, you know, taking the power away from Wall Street. I mean, it's happening en masse and social media's driven it. And it's, it's super encouraging, I think. Yeah, I mean, the biggest threat isn't so much the banks. Um, it's liquidity, as we saw with Robinhood. And it's the SEC, who we don't know what they're going to do. But the SEC throws everybody under the bus because, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. That's what lawyers do, you know. And, and so it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. In my mind, and I just had a recent conversation about this, you know, it's the crypto perspective of, you know, concentrated democratization with voting rights into what happens meets what we saw in Wall Street bets. And when those two merge, that's when it's going to be crazy. And that's what that's what I see, right? The merging of what, what can happen with crypto and tokens. And so imagine like we're talking, um, whether it's um, Aave, whether it's any of the DeFi protocols, you know, whether it's Sushi, whatever, Sushi Red, whatever, right? Um, and, or Polkadot, which has governance characteristics. And they say, okay, we're going to over collateralize because that's what DeFi does, as opposed to what Robinhood did, which gave you margin. And what over collateralization means in in crypto world is you have to have $200 worth of crypto in order to borrow $100 worth. And so imagine in that type of environment where the margin calls don't have the impact we saw, you know, over the past couple of days, um, everybody got 
you know, one share, one vote, you know, and everybody voted on what stock they wanted to pile into. And if you want to assign your voting rights to somebody else, great. And everybody decides how often they'll review. So if you want to watch it minute by minute and vote continuously on your phone, yes, no, yes, no, great, or hour by hour, whatever it is. But once it's tokenized on the blockchain where you have complete transparency, now everybody can pile in and know exactly what's going on and all be in agreement. And you talk about changing the technicals of a stock and changing what, what happens with the stock. And it's not always about just making a stock run. You know, I gave the example, let's just say there's a company that has employee stock ownership and those employees are going to be able to sell at, on a given date. And you want to come in and run the stock up so that they can sell at a higher price. Or this, you know, another company has a great social construct and it's not just get in and get out, but you want, you know, you make a decision as a group to stay in there for six months or a year or five years, right? All these things can happen. But what we saw with Wall Street bets, even though there's a lot of pain along the way for some people who didn't fully know and understand, I think the longer term implications are incredible. I think you're dead right. This is clearly a move towards blockchain at every level, from custody to clearing to derivatives, because this whole thing's a mess, and we've known it since Lehman went under. It needs to be cleaned up. Oh, yeah, there's no question. Right, there's no transparency. You know, there's no real way to trust exactly what's going on. And it's being done, there's just digital versions of the way it's always been done. And, there, you know, we're getting to a time now, look, look at Robinhood, right? If Robinhood was DeFi dealt with like DeFi, they would be crushing it right now, right? Again, people don't realize what NVL is and, you know, people in, in, the, in the DeFi world expect to over collateralize. People in the traditional stock world expect to margin and to, you know, to try to just to goose their returns. Exact opposite. And so if Robinhood had, had been in a position where they understood that the people that were making these buys and sales, you know, if you required over collateralization, they probably would have done it. And it would have been OK because the mission was more important than trying to juice their returns. They probably would have been fine with not doing calls and op, you know, options and calls and puts, you know, because the mission wasn't about juicing returns. It was about beating the man and trying to make some money doing it. And so the game is going to be completely different. So I agree 100 percent with you, Rob, that if you know this is going to go towards blockchain, um, and it will all be better for it. Now, the question becomes, who's blockchain? You know, how is it managed? You know, how decentralized is it, if at all? Um, that, that's a whole different story. Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, people who want to make investments is super interesting because there's tons of, it's like being in VC with real-time mark-to-market. So, you know, yeah. we can invest in a lot of this stuff. Some won't work. Some will do really well. It's like the early days of the internet. It's 100% the early days of the internet. All, you know, brand new. No one really knows what's it's going to be. A lot of projections. A lot of people thought we're crazy. You know, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times when we were starting audio, audio net that turned into broadcast.com. Okay, so yeah, I know you got to download your TCPI client. And yeah, I know you got to have a modem, a 56K modem at least. And <laughs> then you got to download a, an audio video client. But trust me, it's going to get easier. Bro, all I, and I would hear it every day. Bro, all I have to do is turn on my radio. All I have to do is turn on my TV. I got cable TV. I'm getting satellite TV. I don't need this internet craziness to do this. And everybody said, just, you know, internet broadcasting, pfft, there's no chance. There's just no chance. And it was the same concept now that we're hearing now until it changed. And it took time for, you know, with, with streaming as an example, it took a long time. It took, you know, almost 20 years, 18 years before a bandwidth became available enough and cheap enough so that streaming could really, you know, and cord cunning could really happen. And so here we are, you know, and that was 20 years into the internet, give or take, right? And so we're not 20 years, we're only 10, 12 years into crypto, you know, if you're starting the beginning with, with um, Bitcoin and, you know, I don't know exactly how many years with Ethereum and transactional blockchain and smart contracts. So there's a long way to go and there'll be a lot of companies that don't work, but you're going to get some, oh my God, winners. And, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, as awful as it's been, I talked about companies that we're going to look back in 10, 15 years, and there are going to be companies that were created. And, you know, America 2.0 was going to come out of something that happens here. This is it. 
What we're seeing right now with this communal effort and the the foundation of blockchain type applications that can, you know people stuck at home can use to try to make money off you know yield farming off your stimulus check. It's amazing. This it's amazing. is it. That that is just changed the game 180 degrees. And if you don't know it, it's going to smack you down and make you bleed. Yeah, I can't agree more. So, okay, there's a big fight going on now between the between the disruptors and the existing financial system. How does that play out? Because that's going to be a battle, right? Disruptors will win. We just don't know which disruptors or exactly how they'll win, but they'll win. They always do. You know, I don't see any horse and buggies. I don't see any CD manufacturers doing real well. You know, there's just a long list of, you know, we want to keep it the same. Banks will start buying up. You know, banks started to create their own blockchains and tried to do it in a way where they could retain their own business. Look, there's this innovator's dilemma for all companies. The NBA faces it. Direct to consumer streaming versus traditional linear television, right? Banks face it, you know, um, and how you convey money back and forth and the cost and the maintenance and the know your customer. You know, there'll come a time when even though the crypto community will fight all the laws to know your customer stuff, that will inevitably come, right? They will fight it, but then they'll just get used to it, right? Because the number of new people coming in will think it's a good thing. I have no problem with know your customer as someone who owns crypto and does. I'm fine with it, right? If you don't like it, tough shit, right? If you're going to go mainstream, you got to deal with mainstream issues and trying to reduce illegal activity and, and clean that up. That's, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Even though I understand that whole concept of we want it to centralize. We don't want anybody in, in charge. You know, it's big enough and bigger than what, government agencies can control if you just give them the basics of trying to keep it safe for all the new people coming on. And so I think the disruptors are going to win. But again, it's got the same feel the early days of the internet. We don't know all the ones that are going to be the winners yet. So talking about tokenization, it's likely to disrupt the other industry you're in, which is the sports industry, and also the sports personalities. You know, if you think about you know, it's so obvious to me that a lot of the middlemen in this industry, particularly, you know, the agents and all of that sort of stuff, are going to struggle because the power of individual influencers to issue tokens and trade their tokens or sports teams to run huge franchises on. What, how, how are you thinking through this? Because you obviously must be looking at it. Yeah. Digital goods are digital goods, right? Bits are bits. And, you know, we, we always back, you know, when we started AudioNet, we used to say bits are bits. They don't care how they're conveyed, you know, over what platforms. They don't care who receives them, where, when, how, or what, or for how much, right? And it's the same thing with tokenization and digital goods. Anything that can be made and tokenized, can be made digital and tokenized, will be made digital and tokenized. And while, you know, we'll have applications like tickets, oh, let me take a step back. My big light bulb moment was when I sat down on Mintable and Rarible and I put up some, some um, videos that the Mavs had done for sale. And it wasn't so much that I sold them for a lot more than I expected to, but when they ask you, A, would you like to convey copyright? I was like, and then they ask you, what would you like your resale commission to be effectively? And when I saw that, I was like, I fell in love. I literally at that moment, wanted to marry tokenization because <laughs> that's what's been missing in the conveyance of all goods forevermore. And now that we're valuing digital goods in our lives as much or more than all but our biggest purchases, you know, homes, right? Maybe cars, um, but entertainment, everything else is to digitizable or is digital already natively and now tokenizable. I can do it with tickets. I can do it with trading cards like we're seeing with Top Shot, and, but that I create. It, the only limit is my imagination. But now imagine being a photojournalist. You know how you know people get sued because they put some picture that somebody took that they didn't realize was a professional and they didn't have copyright and they sue you for using it, even if it's a picture of you. Well, now if that was tokenized and all those rules were conveyed and the creator got paid if you ever you know resold it or whatever, Oh my God, imagine music. Imagine, you know, um, YouTube. If you create a video and you have one version for retail where instead of worrying about how much money am I making on YouTube, you create three million in a series and you sell them for a dollar a piece and you get 50% if it's ever resold on a marketplace somewhere. 
ding, 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 ding. It's a different game. You know, again, it's just like the same feeling of the early days of the internet when it's like, oh shit, you mean I don't have to do this and I can do this differently? Or even going back before then, I'm old enough where my first job, one of my first jobs out of college that I ended up getting fired from was selling, you know, a spreadsheet on a PC. And it was just like, oh shit. And then when I got fired, I created a company. I'm like, I'm going to connect all these PCs together into what we're, what we're called local area networks. And everybody's like, what the hell is that? We barely know what a PC is, but you just see ding, 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 ding. They're all going to be connected, you know, locally and globally. And I built that company and sold it. Then it was the same with streaming. Then it was the same with HD. Now this is all these people. This is America 2.0. This is this is money 2.0. And I don't mean currency money. I mean, being able to earn money via digital it has all changed. The only thing we don't know is who are the Amazons and who are the pet.coms. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, everything has changed. You know, I think about it. I've been trying to think through the idea of universal basic income, which comes up a lot, right? So imagine if you're actually paid for your time on the internet yep. by the advertisers, via a token system. That helps a lot of people gain an income from things that they do, which right now the advertising. I think it's going to be more fundamental than that, right? I think advertising, but you're right. It, it'll it'll create, you know, actually selling your time and attention, but also making commitments. And so we're working on an application where I won't go into all the details because it's still all being figured out. But effectively, it says if you commit to buy from this brand using this token, right, we'll pay you because I don't have to buy advertising. Yeah. You know, now, now you're with me and I know if you're you're living up to your agreement or not. And let's go. Right now we're going to sell Nestle's quick, you know, a whole lot easier because now we've got, you know, all these committed people who are using this token, token to buy Nestle's quick. So clearly your big thought process here is this is a massive secular cycle that's in yeah. the making. And we've only probably just started because we have no clarity yet of where it's going. We just know it's going there. I would have given you a completely different answer six months ago. And when I was on Real Vision a couple of years ago with Kyle, I did give a completely answer. Yeah, AI you gave. Yeah, and I still, AI and this go hand in hand, right? But at the same time, I still believe what I told Kyle back then that, you know, Bitcoin is not going to be a currency. You know, they, it was called cryptocurrency because that's the way they wanted to market it. It's a crypto asset. It's not a currency. And it's not going to be a currency. And it's not going to be, you know, a hedge against fiat and printing too many fiat dollars. No, it is a store of value. Bitcoin particularly is a store of value that is going to increase in value because it's scarce. And if you have more buyers and sellers, it'll retain its value and most likely go up in value. And that's a good thing. It still doesn't have any more utility right now other than, than a banana, right? So if you're hungry, I'd rather have a banana than Bitcoin, but I'd rather have Bitcoin stored, right? Because in terms of value, Bitcoin is worth more. But at the same time, we're starting to see via DeFi how you can use that Bitcoin and either swap it or turn it in and wrap it right into wrap Bitcoin that effectively you know, mimics the, the value proposition and allows you to do more um, because it's more like Ethereum, right? And, and more like you know, other applications. And so you know, I think... Bitcoin will stay a store of value. It won't ever be a currency. And I don't think other than digital coins, right? I don't think most crypto and most tokens are geared towards being currency. I know Bitcoin Cash tries to be, and if you go to the islands and everything, can you, are, is it ever, is it taken anywhere in, in the Caymans? No. No. You know, it's just like we put up five years ago, six years ago, whenever I wanted to see if anybody would spend Bitcoin to buy stuff at the Mavericks. And then I did it again three years ago. Um, and then we announced it again two years ago and we sold, I think, $314 worth. Yeah. And well, because if it is going up and it's got this skewed risk reward because it's based on kind of Metcalf's law and adoption theory, why the hell would you sell it to buy a burger at a, at a Mavs game? It's ridiculous. That's exactly right. Why would you convey it at all? Right. Why would you convey it at all? You know, it's like, and look, if, if we had a big bout of inflation, but your personal inflation rate was 6% and you got 14%, you know, in, in a bank, you're going to put it in the bank. And if Bitcoin is flat at that time, you're going to yank it out of Bitcoin and put it in the bank, you know? And so it, it really is a store of value in a traditional sense. But I do think a lot of 
I think we're, we'll really start to see some wholesale changes and, and change of perspective when you see countries take some of their um, sovereign gold storage and turn it into Bitcoin or some other crypto asset um, just as a store of value. And I think there will be some who do that. And just like they, you know, they work from the mindset of, you know, well, we have gold, so our currency is worth more, even though there's no real correlation. Nobody looks at the price of the dollar and say, well, how much gold does the United States have in Fort Knox? Right. Nobody does that. Right. Nobody. And so there's no relationship between the two, but it sends the right message. And if you're going to start issuing digital coins, and look, most currency is digital anyway. It's probably 99% of currency is digital right now anyways. It's sitting in a bank account, you know, or wherever. Um, and when it's transferred, it's digital. You don't see people walking around with bags of coins or cash. And so when there's a country that's looking to issue digital coins, it wouldn't shock me. And I would kind of expect them to sell some of their digital gold storage that they have in storage and use that as the explanation to say, OK, we're going to buy Bitcoin and we're going to go against Bitcoin to issue our own digital coins. And so maybe, you know, as a as a derivative, Bitcoin becomes currency, but not um, I don't think it'll be currency directly. No, it's more like a reserve asset. And that kind of makes sense. Well, exactly, like right. That's a better way to put it. It's a reserve asset. And just like gold is considered a reserve asset when it's not. You know, if, if the world goes to hell in a handbasket, there ain't nobody walking around with a gold bar, you know, because somebody bigger is just going to knock your ass out and take your gold bar. And they're still going to be hungry. But if I have a banana, you'll give me your gold bar. Well, because it was really interesting in Argentina back in whatever it was, 2001, when they had that big crisis and they stole all the money out of the bank accounts, converted the dollars and devalued the peso. Right. The country ran out of money. So what they did so that's when the gold bugs are right. This is the chance. What happened is nobody could value a gold bar or a gold coin. So everything traded at, at 18 karat jewelry prices. So the thing that was fungible was jewelry because every wife, every girlfriend, every it's guy. Got it's got something and, it, and it's transferable. Yeah, that's great. And you kind of figure out it could be 22 karat, could be 18 karat, could be nine karat. So we value everything at this. And we can then barter with gold. And the banana vendor on the corner of the street that had bananas can get all the jewelry they want. They set the price, right? Exactly right. So how do you think about, before we move on to some other topics, how do you think about investing in this space then? In terms of, you know, allocation, you know, what percentage you think about and how? I mean, I don't think so much in terms of percentages. I've got the, the stocks that I've owned for years now, basically. Yeah. Um, in March, when things kind of cratered, I bought some more stuff and I've sold some of that since. And then I invest in private companies like the things we're talking about, because I think that's where the greatest return comes. But what about crypto itself? How do you think about your allocation to crypto? You know, um, Allocation to crypto, I've been accumulating over the years and I've just never sold. Um, I've swapped out some for Aave recently. So, I don't, you know, so the way I look at it is where can something go? And so I had... Um, a bunch of Ethereum from when it first came out, or not about a year after it came out. And then um, I bought some more, you know, a few months ago, I forget how many, you know, six, seven months ago, whatever. Um, and I bought Litecoin, LTC. And then recently, because I wanted to understand um, DeFi more, I um, bought a bunch of Aave and I staked a bunch of it. And um, I also bought some Sushi Swap. And since I did stuff on Rarible, now I have Rari tokens and I'll see what happens with that. So I'm not looking to trade in and out. So I'm not a day trader at all. That just takes too much work. And I don't, you know, there's a lot of narrative stories that go on with, with tokens right now where, oh, this is going to be this and this is going to be that. And there's a couple of them I bought where I said, okay, I'm going to put in $10,000 and just for shits and giggles, but I'm not going to tell you which ones they are because I don't want to be yelled at. <laughs> um, and, and so... Um, I don't really have an investment strategy. It's like, I've got a lot, you know, um, I've, I've, every time they list those, the whale list, let's just say, you know, my private um, wallets that everybody else, thank God, doesn't have after some of them came out or one of them came out, um, I'm, I'm in that. So it's big enough to, to be Massive. on those lists, but I, I have no interest in selling them. I mean, it, it, they've no. grown, done well. And so, so you're thinking of like VC, you're just putting some bets across the space, reasonable size, and let it develop and see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, and it actually wasn't so much bets. It was more, how can I learn and have enough skin? Oh, yeah. in it's kind of like going to a blackjack table. If I bet $5, I'm bored, right? And so it's just, <laughs> you know, and I want to learn about it. Um, 
and understand API, you know, um, the yield farming and DeFi and all that stuff. And so I've messed with it some um, and I track it, but I'm, I'm not, you know, if Bitcoin craters, then I would buy more, right? If Ethereum goes back under a thousand, then I'll buy more, right? Um, but I'm not out there chasing it. So I want to move on a bit to the more public markets now. Stuff like the valuation of tech, of big tech, is is pretty high because of interest rates, as you've talked about, and where else do people put capital? How are you thinking through that? Because it, it feels like you need, for, for some of these big companies to double from here, needs a tectonic shift in something because the valuation's so crazy. Yes and no. Um, I'll tell you why. I mean, two of my biggest holdings are, or my two biggest holdings are Amazon and Netflix. Yeah. Um, and they have been for years. And the reason I stay with them is to me, when you look, if you go through that list, Fang and Microsoft and whoever else you want to put on there as the, the biggest valuations, the one common thread that they have is one, they've been doing AI for a decade in many cases, and two, they're really good at it. And that is the differentiator. I don't look at it and say, oh, you know, what is Amazon going to get into next and what can their sales go to, right? Or the same with Microsoft. I look at it and say, are these guys great at AI? Yeah. And who else is good at AI? And the AI haves are this many, and the AI have nots is everybody else. Because it's impossible to do. It's so expensive. It takes so much knowledge. AI is hard to do right. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, I compare it to the dawn of the internet age, but it's more like blockchain, right? Blockchain is hard to do right and to get adoption and to consumerize it and, you know, AI is even harder to do right because you've got to be able to afford to make mistakes. You've got to go through the learning process of what is impactful and what's not. You know, if you're Google and Amazon, you have research groups and you're hiring and it's hard to hire all the right people. And if this country doesn't get a lot more AI engineers, we're going to fall behind other countries at some point. But that's that's how I look at my investment strategy for those companies um, and why I stick with them. So if you're not a great AI company, I have no interest in, in being a big investor. Yeah, because that is a huge moat. I mean, it is really difficult to compete. And that goes, okay, so that, how does this tie back to Wall Street bets, right? Because when I'm looking at potential investments, um, I get so many deals pitched to me, oh, AI, AI, AI. And I've spent enough time learning and doing tutorials and all that shit to understand it, right? Reading research papers, all that stuff, because I'm a geek. Um, and 99% of those pitches are bullshit, right? You know, oh, this guy was at MIT and he was the best at this. And then you ask a couple of questions and it's a spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> and when you look at it and you realize how hard it is, then, you know, it's like there's just a few people that are doing it. But you know who doesn't understand it? because there's people investing in those deals that I'm getting pitched that are bullshit, traditional Wall Street. They don't get all that stuff. Not that the Wall Street betters understand it inherently, right? You don't, the digital generation still doesn't understand AI, right? It's still hard. Um, and it's not like they're using that as an investment criteria that I'm aware of, but traditional Wall Street doesn't at all. And so when they're talking about bets and they're looking at this company versus this company and how can the fangs go up to be from one trillion in valuation to 1.6 in multiple months when that's more increased, that's, you know, that $600 billion delta is more than 90% of the, the, the S&P 500 AI. And AI isn't just about what new products are you going to create. That's probably the smallest amount. You know, I invested in these 16 year old kids, a company called Price Stack. Um, he was the son of an uh, old, old friend of mine. And um, he, he came to me and said, okay, we've got this AI starting with machine learning that's going to integrate into Shopify that will automatically, based off of these data sets that we're able to collect and normalize and, and check, tell companies how to price the products that they're putting for sale on their Shopify, um, on the Shopify site. Um, and I'm like, oh, yes. 16 years old. Yes. Now they're 18. Right. Yes. And a better part is it works. Now we're trying to come up with ways to make it self-service. And when I talk about the difference between the AI haves and AI have nots, Amazon knows exactly how to price. Walmart knows exactly how to price. The little guy just working has no clue how to price. 
And this company, if they get any traction at all, Spotify has to buy them because if big commerce buys them, right? Spotify's torched. And so those are the types of things the AI haves are dominating. And Wall Street hasn't fully comprehended the impact of AI on what happens behind the scenes. I talked to somebody at one of the bank companies who told me that it added $9 billion in revenue in one quarter because they were able to use AI. Now, that also has a negative component because look at what Facebook does with AI to try to you know, um, promote a, um, different viewpoints, right, just to maximize um, revenue. And so, you know, we can argue, and I think Roger McNamee said it best, that if you algorithmically promote any content, it should not get 230 um, protections, right? Because it's not just somebody putting something out there, it's you promoting it. Um, and so there's a negative side of that that we have to be aware of as well. And then there's a government side of it, you know, there's defense, you know, you, we, if we don't win AI, we're, we're stuck, you know, and same with robotics and, you know, you know, just AI is that massive, that impactful. And if you're going to invest, um, you better have a strong concept and understanding of it, or you're going to make mistakes. That's a super interesting way of looking at it. Also, it creates this black hole, right? The people with the most AI win everything, or they buy no, everybody. That's exactly what's happening. It's like, it's a sucking, the giant sucking sound are, are a bunch of neural networks sucking you know, valuation away from other companies towards right. these big AI companies. But then you create monopolies. And obviously the EU are already pissed off about it. The US is starting to get pissed off about it. What do you think about the break of the potential? Break them up? I don't care. It's going to create more shareholder value. You know, yeah. during the, the Trump administration, I would have said no, because we really didn't have an AI strategy from them until the end. And so effectively what was happening is those top AI companies were our, you know, um, United States AI strategy, right? All the research and everything was coming from them. And now we're, we've got more of a definitive AI robotic strategy. And I think that's important. Um, so I would have given you a different answer a year ago, you know, not knowing what was going to happen at the federal level when it came to AI investment and research. And at the end of the Trump campaign, not to throw them completely under the bus, right, they did, you know, make a commitment to doing that. And, and that was a good thing. But now we'll be able to get the best AI people in there as opposed to just friends of friends. And so, you know, it's it's going to have it, it's that significant. So. I want to get on to some of the kind of societal issues and some of the solutions. Obviously, we've seen this massive dichotomy between listed markets, Wall Street and Main Street, right? The average guy has been totally screwed in this whole thing. It was no fault of his own. Right. So, you know, we, we run a hairdressing salon or a restaurant or whatever, right? Everybody's destroyed, which is terrible, but also good because it changes business models. Creative destruction, right? Hopefully. I mean, I was talking today to uh, Mayor Suarez of Miami, and he's got a kind of good vision of what they're trying to do over there. How do you think we can use technology to solve some of this kind of 1%, 99%, or just to create a fairer society or something that functions better than the Fed handing out money to banks? Well, it's like you and I talked a little bit earlier, right? You can only keep up if you have appreciable assets. If you're getting paid by the hour a straight salary and it's not enough for you to invest somewhere else, you're always going to fall behind because you're just trying to keep up and, and pay your bills. Um, and so the first step is to require, just like we require a social security number, that everybody has a digital bank account. Period. End of story. It, it's crazy that in 2021, we're going to be sending physical checks <laughs> that need to be deposited at a bank and clear and have a cost associated with them it's for our stimulus checks. It's just bizarro. And so that needs to happen ASAP. And you, know, you can create accounts and we can argue about who should host them or where or what, um, but it should be for a variety of digital assets, including stocks. And, you know, if I was running the commerce department, if you will, you know, I'd be saying whatever the United States invests in, let's just say it's NIH. You know, I do a lot of healthcare research in, and I think it's 136 of 160, the numbers aren't exact, of single molecule top selling drugs were funded initially by the NIH. And they just put out licenses and the, the country doesn't really make any money off of it. Um, and they don't even limit the pricing. And so that's where we get the runaway drug pricing. And so 
I would also allow that digital account to own shares of stock. And if the NIH does something where it puts out a license, you know, and we're able to get equity back, then you split that 330 million ways. And it goes into your account, your account, your account, your account, your account. And if the number goes up to 331 million, then you split it 331 million ways. And I mean, I know that's far-fetched and unlikely to happen, but until you allow people to accumulate digital assets of any kind, money or otherwise, or appreciable assets, I should say, um, you're always going to have have and have nots. So what's the impediment now then? I mean, people can have a 401k. I mean, it doesn't really... You got to pay your bills. If you're broke, you know, you want to worry about, you know, I've had my lights turned off before. I've had my credit cards cut up before. That comes first. You know, and you've got to really be able to save and saving is not easy. And, you know, I tell people when people ask me, what should I do? You know, money, you got to have nine. First, you pay off your credit cards because that's a guaranteed return. Right. If you're paying 19 or 29 percent, pay them off. Right. Then you got to save six to nine months because you never know when the next pandemic. Now, in the past, I would have said six months. Now, you know, six to nine months of um, have cash in the bank or liquidity so that you can pay something in case of emergency. Then you can start looking at, at investing in investable assets. But as it turns out, according to you know data that I've seen, you know, 50% of the people in this country, or maybe it's 40% of the people have $400 or less in the bank. So how are they going to put money in a 401k or save money or buy stocks? You can't. And so, you know, I'm not a, a fan of universal basic income, but I am a fan of sharing what the, what America Inc. creates, mm. right? And we need to think more like America Inc. or USA Inc. when it comes to the deals that we make, um, because when we just put them into the, the capitalist system, and I'm a huge capitalist, don't get me wrong, right? We're just giving the money to a few. And it's not going to trickle down. So, so kind of like like Norway's sovereign wealth fund, for example, where you know they share in the oil wealth by yeah. essentially creating a future for the whole we country. We did that in Alaska too, or we did. I don't know if we still do. Right? We shared the wealth in Alaska, where they got premium payments based off all the oil money that, that was up there. And so, yeah, we can do that. But you know, you can you can put parameters on it where. You know, even if your you know your kid is six days old, they get a digital account, and if the next day some deal happens, they're going to get you know their shares of stock, and they have to hold it until they're 21 or whatever it may be. You know, and everybody else has got to hold it a minimum of 10 years. So people just because in Russia, believe it or not, when Russia um, when communism collapsed and they went to private enterprise or pretended to, they gave out these coupons for all the government owned businesses, and people immediately sold the coupons immediately. And the people who held on to them or bought the other ones are the ones who made money. So you want to put in some restrictions so that it really has the, the end game that you want to accomplish. You're an optimist by nature, being a technologist at core. Where do the risks lie? I mean, uh, unbelievably, we have a pandemic. Wall Street goes to all-time highs, while Main Street's decimated. It's kind of, we wouldn't have had that bet very easily, but that's what's happened. Where's the risks lie in all of this? Risk by is that I think the biggest risk is that politicians remain politicians, um, and that the partisanship that we face now stays as stringent as it is, as as divisive as it is. And when I say politicians being politicians, um, look at what's going on now. You know, the Republicans used to at least feel you know they wanted smaller government and everything was trickle down. Trickle down doesn't work. The Democrats want trickle down as well, but they want big program trickle down, right? Where you fund all these huge programs and it tr trickles down and finds its way to the people who need it. That doesn't work. It gets lost and we're not very efficient at doing it. But here we are right now working on this program where we're providing stimulus money. And you know what? That's worked. That has absolutely worked. <laughs> you know, you invest in, you know, if you're able to borrow money for who knows how long um, at less than 1%, and invest in the American people and get a return of greater than 1%, you know, traditional investors will tell you that's pretty good. Um, and even if, you know, if you're, you're borrowing capital at a half a percent or 0.75 and earning 1.5, doubling your money relatively quickly is not a bad thing. Yes, there's the question of overhang of debt. Yes, there's the issue of um, how do we pay it back at some point in the future? But the reality is we're going through a new period where we've never done this before, right? You know, we haven't, you know, Ben Bernanke famously asked about doing a helicopter drop. We did a helicopter drop. 
and it worked. And here we are about to do another helicopter drop. And my fear is that the Democrats are going to be Democrats. And rather than saying, one, our interest rate expense is lower than it used to be because of the interest or our interest rate expense is lower because of interest rates and say, let's just play it out. It's working so far. Yeah, our, our debt levels are growing, but name me one company or person who doesn't grow their debt levels when you can borrow cheap if you can get a greater return. And if we're just patient and continue to invest in America, Inc., or see what happens with this latest $2,000, the, the additional $1,400 that hopefully gets out there in the near future, um, we might learn that you know, some version of modern monetary theory works. And my biggest fear is we'll go back to being dogmatic and just jack up prices because, you know, screw rich people. That's not about that. You want me to pay. I'll make a deal with Elizabeth Warren. Just tax me. Right. Just Mark Cuban. Nobody else. Right. Keep it exactly the way it is, because I really think that, you know, it's interesting when you kind of think through the flow of money. If it goes from government, from me, right, or other taxpayers, and it goes to an individual who's now spending it. And I think it should be use it or lose it, but it's too late to get that in, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not really being saved by most people. Um, and with the 75K and under, a lot of people will spend it. But when you spend it on the things you want, that's actually the best selection criteria for um, for investment, right? You know, because you're putting it in companies you want, they're creating margin dollars and re they're reinvesting. So you have what the Republicans want, right, which is top down, only the investment decisions aren't being made by government, the Democratic approach, right? They're being made by consumers and they're putting their money where they find the, the greatest need. And then if you, you know, whatever that amount is we need to do after this, you don't need to, you know, put all these delay situations in for rent and for commercial rent and everything else, because the people who are paying the rent that they were delaying now have enough money to do that. And it trickles up. Right. And I think, you know, there's no historic proof. There's no models that prove it one way or the other, but I'm sure we can create them, you know. Um, right, any model. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the reality is top, I mean, bottom up, where the smartest consumers are able to invest their money the best way they see fit, whether it's paying their rent, buying food for the to their table, or buying crypto for all that matters, right? Or putting it in the bank. Again, I prefer use it or lose it, but if you have excess capital and you're investing it, by definition, you have you're making 75 grand or less. So it's not a bad thing if you're saving that money, right? And maybe you will get some appreciable assets. So don't fuck it up by trying to be a traditional Democrat and just jack up taxes, taxes and create all these new programs when letting people spend their money where they see it most effectively is better than those programs. And I agree what my my thought of here, you know, watching the horror of the world getting so polarized in politics, and you just think, why can't people be pragmatic? So how do you get Washington to become pragmatic and say, what are the problems? How do we apply the right solutions, regardless of what's deemed to be Democrat or Republican? Because it's nonsense. That's just tribalism. Oh, yeah, and ranked choice voting. So I read, I read this book, I think it's called The Politics Business, maybe it's the Politics Industry. Um, and, you know, they talked about the fact that um, when you think about how politicians get elected, you know, there's you've got the duopoly of Republicans and Democrats, but they have to get through a primary first. And we don't vote very well or very much in primaries. But the people who do vote are the ones that are the most partisan. And the people that do donate money are the ones that are the most partisan. And as a result, those politicians who want to get through that primary have to go to the extremes in order to get money and votes. Wow. Now, if you put in ranked choice voting, then you can say, okay, this guy or this woman I like more than this one. And so this is my second choice, my third choice. Then it goes through this process where you eliminate the, the one getting the least votes until you have somebody who has 50% or more. But in that environment, because you can be second and not feel bad, right, and work your way through, and the New York mayoral um um, election is going to do this as well. And some others in San Francisco and others have done it. And it seems to, to be working as intended, right? And you seem to get a little bit less of this partisanship. But of course, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party 
don't like that because it really goes against who they are, which is controlling, you know, um, who the candidates are. So go back to where we started this all with with technology. Part of the problem of politics is these platforms and the algorithm. The AI itself is creating a problem. Mm -hmm. What do we do about it? Or do we just not do anything about it? I mean, I don't know. I'm torn between the free street speech argument and you're fucking everything up argument. <laughs> yeah, well, I was always free speech until recently, and, and I realized they just fucked it up, right? You know, Roger McNamee, I think it's called him Frank. Roger McNamee, again, said it best. You know, at the heart of this is the Section 230 protections, right? Yeah. Where anybody can say anything, anytime, and the platform is protected. But it's the choice in, you know, you might deflect and say, okay, it's the neural networks that are making these decisions, but it's your company that are decide that's deciding you're trying to optimize revenue and it doesn't matter what the network or the algorithms promote. And to me, that's not acceptable. That's wrong because, you know, you just, you, that's at the heart to your point of a lot of this partisanship, because when you create a personalized um, silo of information that people get continuously, you know, or a personalized group that, or, or a personalized echo chamber for a group, you know, um, that's going to create problems. And it's not hard to identify that that's a problem, you know, and by removing those 230 protections for any um, algorithmically promoted um, presentations, I think you eliminate most of that, if not all of it. And effectively, it makes us go back to the early days of social media where you followed somebody and you got their posts. And it doesn't have to be in chronological order. And if you like something, okay, you know, you like popsicles, we'll tell you about popsicles. You like, you know, the Dallas Mavericks, we'll tell you about the Dallas Mavericks. Based off of a network determining that because you like popsicles and because you like you know, red wagons that you're most like you're you're like a lot of people who like far right wing conspiracy theories. And now we're going to promote to you. And oh, by the way, we put one out there. You you took the bait. And now we're going to put five, 10, 20 out there. Let or left wing conspiracy theories for that matter. Right. Um, that's just wrong. And they should not be protected for that. And also, in the end, there's no way you could have done what you've done in your career in investing if you'd have been in filter bubbles. If you were only listening to people telling you about what they think you should think about, you wouldn't have discovered anything new. It's ridiculous. I don't know why people do it, but it's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, look, who knows? I think I'm far from the psychologist to understand it, but I think part of it was revolt. You know, I talked to one of my friends and I asked, you know, because I know Donald Trump and I, you know, he's not, anyway, um, he's gone. <laughs> So it doesn't matter. And I, and I asked him, why are you voting for this guy after I went through these litany of things and my experiences with him? He goes, let me tell you something, Mark. He's in his mid 50s at the time. I've been voting for politicians my entire life. And you know what they've done for me? Nothing. I would vote for a ham sandwich over a politician. Right. And so when you've got that and we're seeing it with Wall Street bets. When you've got that battle, right, of it's got we, we need something better or this doesn't make sense because I'm always on the short end of the stick. Right. Then maybe you're going to believe conspiracy theories because you want to try to make sense. And I'll go back one more time. Um, so the early days of streaming, there was a guy who was on the radio named his name was Art Bell. And all he did was talk about conspiracy theories and aliens. And it was the number one show that streamed on Broadcast.com for a good year. People are looking for answers. And he used to say the answer is out there somewhere, him and the X-Files, right? And that's what people are looking for, something to make sense of all this. And if we make it economically rewarding to pander to that and we allow that and still protect people when they do it, that's a mistake. Absolutely right. Mark, look, fascinating to speak to you. Great to pick your brain. Right? Appreciate it, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we'll get you back at some point as well. And uh, Yeah, we'll do it in the Caymans. Absolutely right. I'm looking forward to it. As soon as our borders open, you'll be over here. Amen.